just wanted to say hello to everyone here and um, everyone on Facebook Live. Hello, welcome, and so good to see you. Everyone here on the Zoom meeting live, thank you so much for joining us. Lovely to see you all. It's good to see you. And all of you that are joining us by audio on Apple Podcast or whichever um, platform you're using, welcome to you too. It's Tuesday Talk with Brenda and uh, our special guest today, Ina Ghoul. And I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. My goodness, what a great week we've had. Ina Ghoul, you want to unmute you? There you go, sis. What a great week we've had, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's been good. Um, our doors are going to be closed here at the Zoom meeting. So if you want to jump on really fast, please do that quickly. And then we're going to close our doors and we'll open them up again for our after party. So one of the best things that we have here with the um, Zoom, with Zooming live here for our Tuesday talk is that we have an after party. And we do that after we're all um, finished with chatting with our guests. And so everybody's welcome to come on jump on. Uh, if you're watching live stream, just jump on and we will be able to um, chit chat with you. We turn off the mics, there's no recording, and we just have a nice fun chat with everybody. Uh, and I look forward to having that with you today. So we will do that. Wonderful. All right, let's get started. Ina Ghoul. Oh, sister, I am so glad you're here today. I have been wanting to get you here for a while. <laughs> It's really good. Um, I, Nicole, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do real quick is just share a little bit about you, um, a, little bit of your, a little bit of your background, and then that way we can just jump right in. And correct me if I say some things wrong, okay? Would you do that okay. for me? <laughs> because yeah. I'm probably going to slaughter a whole bunch of things. Um, you were born in Kazakh Kazakhstan, correct? Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Okay, good. Well, I didn't do too bad. <laughs> I thought it was Kazakhstan. <laughs> Kazakhstan. Okay. Um, and then you were adopted by a, um, a, a family that was involved in adoption ministry. And they adopted you and brought you from that. And this is an amazing story uh, to the United States. And you ended up in Montana, right? Yep. Okay. And your parents worked in the adoptions ministries. One of the things that I want you all to know about Ina Ghoul, and that's uh, one of the one of the wonderful things that we're going to learn about her today, is that she has a passion for post adoption uh, in the in the United States because she has walked through this in her life. She has a passion for it to help other families and children with. Uh, the adoption process after it has occurred. So all of the things that happen that regular people that aren't involved in that or have never been adopted would not understand some of the undercurrent things that happen, correct, Ina Gold? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and she, it's really amazing because this is something that happened to you and you were put into a family that this was happening. And so, Wow. I mean, does mm -hmm. God not plan things out really well? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and you want to bring healing to people too. And that's like another thing that's really passionate inside of you is to bring healing mm -hmm. to those that are, have gone through this process of adoption. Um, and we're going to get into a few things that are, you know, um, subjects that are difficult, but sister, the way that you walk it out, and the grace that you have, I know that it is just going to be the bomb of Gilead upon people today when we talk about the issues that uh, children have, PTSD and trauma, anxiety, things like that, that you deal with on a regular basis and, um, and you are overcoming and how you're doing that. That's another one of the things I really can't wait for you to talk about. And sister, you are full of music. You are very <laughs> creative. You're, you write you uh, write songs, you write poetry, you write, you're writing blogs, you're writing a book, actually, I mean, you're writing a book. <laughs> this, yeah. is gonna be, this is amazing. Um, and you met Jesus when you were really, really, really young. And he 
he has been your mainstay all of these years and through all of the things that you uh, have gone through. And um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you a little bit about that. My first question to you, of course, is going to be uh, in, in, in a condensed form. Uh, how did you start walking this the way, this way of seeing Yeshua as your Messiah? How did that come about? I think actually what we need to do is kind of preface that with how you grew up and then how about if we just kind of address that in the story okay. would that be okay yeah okay so let's just jump right in sis tell us a little bit about your story about you know where you were born um, and what happened and what was the story of this um amazing journey that the holy one has been uh directing you through your lech lecha moment <laughs> <laughs> where yeah. you were where you were brought to the United States. So um, you were put up for adoption at birth? Yes, I was institutionalized from birth. Okay. And so uh, when you were five years old, you were uh, involved with a host program, correct? Is that where we start? Yes. Okay. So my parents hosted me at the age of five for six weeks in Montana. And actually that's when I first learned about God and I would assume Jesus, but I'm not mm -hmm. really sure how much I knew or understood because of the language barrier. Mm -hmm. All I remember is that I heard that there was a God that loved me and wanted a relationship with me. Wow. And I was like, sure, <laughs> totally. And so uh, one of the things that the orphanage director said about me was when I came back, I was just happy, excited. And one of my favorite songs in the orphanage was Jesus Loves Me. But um, I think there is something about coming to America and then going back to the orphanage where you start realizing that this is not how children are supposed to grow up. And so I dealt with a lot of depression and uh, almost to the point of suicidal ideation. And in that time, I wanted to know God more. I wanted to believe that he loved me. I wanted to believe that he wanted a relationship with me. So I would just spend most of my time in the orphanage talking to him and telling him what's going on and all my, everything that I was dealing with and just begging him to get me out of there. And it was really interesting because when I came back to the orphanage, I think there was a lot of resentment at the fact that I got to go to America and the caregivers would say some of the, some really horrific things like, oh, your parents didn't want you and that's why you're back. And then all of a sudden one day they're like, get dressed, your parents are here. And I'm like, what? And I walk into the room and I'm thinking like, I have to leave immediately with my parents. Like I have no opportunity to say goodbye. Like my life is just thrown. And it ended up being the parents who had hosted me. So then there was all this turmoil of like, but you didn't want me. Like, wh wh why do you want me back? And oh, so, so you were dealing, you were dealing with the, 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 this, this, after the six weeks you came back and then you were under the impression that they basically threw you away, that mm -hmm. they didn't want you. Yeah. And so you didn't think that the parents that they told you were coming to get you were the parents that had thrown you away. Yeah. I yeah. see. Wow. Yeah. Sister, that's a lot of rejection. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, um, I, I was adopted and I think I struggled still a lot with depression and trauma and anxiety and just that frustration when you have um, developmental delays of or, or social awkwardness of like, I'm not a normal human being and I can't interact with my peers and I can't seem to get anything right. And so there was that, that pressure of like, I'm trying so hard and I'm not doing it right. So even then, like I kept praying to God, asking for healing, asking for him to help me through, through everything that I was experiencing. And then there was also on top of that, we, my parents ran um, an adoption ministry. One of the things that they did was they ran their own hosting program. So we saw a lot of families who were hosting and adopting and going through the struggle of adoption. And I in some ways my heart broke for some of the families where it didn't work out, but in other ways, I was just impressed at the families who fought well and who kept their kids and who, who tried really hard to understand in a, in a time where we didn't really understand about trauma and what all institutionalization does and developmental delays and all that kind of stuff. Um, but anyways, that kind of, I think because I had experienced God in the orphanage where he was the only person I could talk to 
I continued that throughout the rest of my life. And um, in seventh grade, I ended up doing neurofeedback and it changed my world. Like I could start relating to people more. I could start, like I didn't have as much behavioral issues and I felt human. <laughs> it sounds kind of dumb, but I felt human after that. No, that doesn't, um, that doesn't sound dumb at all. That was, so it, and that, that was when you were in seventh grade. Yeah. So, and in seventh grade, because of course this is, th- these things are all happening and there's, there's like no book already written on how to deal with all of these things. Yes. And so your parents are doing the very best that they can and, and getting through this, mm-hmm. but then this opportunity for this occurred which was giving you tools. Yes. Helped you to move forward. And that is really, that is really fantastic that even though your parents were, they were doing the best that they could, but they didn't understand, of course, how could they, they didn't know offering this to you was Mm -hmm. something that changed your life. I I wanted to real quick before you move on, I, I wanted to say that you were telling me a little bit about the story of when the parent, when your parents came and got, came to get you the whole time after you were sent back to the orphanage, when you were in the United States for six weeks, and then you were sent back to the orphanage, the whole time that that was going on, how long was that? Was that about a year? I think it might've been, I think it was around six months. About six months. So for those six months, you were under the impression that you'd been rejected that, uh, that that was not going to be your family, that your family had decided that they didn't want you. And you were going through that trauma, that survival and trying to survive during that time period. Um, and yes. for some reason, that just really hit me that that was during that time, it was like, um, I saw it kind of like how when Joseph was uh, ripped out of Potiphar's house and thrown into the dungeon, it's like he, he gets this relief of having this um, this time period where he could actually function, you know, and he's, he's incorporated into this family and then all, and then something turns around and then he gets thrown into the pit. And, Mm -hmm. um, I just see that, that, that this, even though this was the most difficult of all, and I, and I don't even know how you survived it. I really don't, but God had a plan and I keep seeing, I keep hearing Joseph say to his brothers, I know that you, I know that you meant this for harm, but God meant this for good. I keep seeing that in you, like, (laughs) like you just saying, yeah, yeah. I know that, that you meant this for harm. You know, the workers at the orphanage were very cruel. Um, and, um, you know, I'm sorry for that, but, uh, God meant it for good. And he's, and he strengthened you. And I truly see this like a Joseph story where he was strengthening you. He was, he was teaching you the grit that you're made of. This is the Mm -hmm. soil that you're made of. This is the same soil that formed Abraham, Isaac, Mm -hmm. Jacob, Yeshua. This is the same soil. And that's what's in you sister. And so I'm sorry, but I just had to, I just had to let you know that this is like rolling over me. I appreciate, I appreciate the interruption, but, um, okay. So seventh grade, you, you, all of a sudden you're given these tools Mm -hmm. and now things are starting to click like the developmental delays, all of a sudden you're figuring out how to function a little bit better. Okay, go. Yes. (laughs) And um, it, so it's really cool. Seventh grade was kind of a big year because that was also the year that my grandfather passed away. Uh-huh. And our, my parents part of their adoption Okay, hold on one second, sis. We just lost your, we just lost your sound. Can you hear me? Mm-mm, no. That's okay. Technical difficulties. Speak amongst yourselves. <laughs> eh. While I while Ina Ghoul is getting that um, taken care of, I just wanted to say thanks again for everyone listening on um, Facebook Live and also on the podcasts. And we will get this uh, sound issue. Oh, I think I think we're back. Yay! Nope, still can't hear you. <laughs> Okay. So what, anyway, there you go. Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. 
What right. ended up happening was this disconnected. So now it's just going over the computer. That's fine. We'll just, we'll yeah. take you any way we can get you, sis. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So my parents, uh, part of their ministry was that they helped build an orphanage in the Philippines. Mm. and they were expanding it through a medical clinic and a new baby home and all that kind of stuff. Wow, so, that is so impressive. <laughs> How do people even think that way? Right? It's amazing. Kathy Merrick, you too. <laughs> I just think, what? <laughs> Go ahead. And so when we had decided, because my grandpa had been having health issues, we had decided that when he passed away, that we would probably move to the Philippines for an extended period of time so that they could help get the medical clinic running get the baby home going and the missionary home going and just they, there was a lot going on so in seventh grade the same year that I did normal feedback my grandpa passed away so we started working towards moving to the Philippines and I wait wait, was, wait hold on one second so w when you say that your grandpa passed away he was a person that was of major he was he was a major figure in your life oh yes he, he was. was a person who one of the only people in your extended family, your extended adoptive family, mm -hmm. who actually accepted you other than your parents. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. his passing was very, um, yes. it was very traumatic for you. And it was also, um, it was the loss of someone who actually accepted you for exactly who you were. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was extremely difficult for me for that reason. Okay. So then you, that, that suffering of that loss was something that it spurred something within you. And then your parents, you went with your parents to the Philippines. Um, well, before that, um, mm -hmm. I think there was this double loss of like, so my grandfather is dead and he was someone that I connected well with, uh, to, there was also the, the fact that I was supposed to visit him, like two weeks before he passed away. It didn't end up happening. Oh. And I hadn't seen him for like two years before that. Um, but then there was also that other layer of like, now we're gonna start moving towards the Philippines. And I didn't wanna go to the Philippines. Everyone else thought it was a great idea. And I'm like, I like Montana. <laughs> but uh, I think my parents had spent a year going back and forth to the Philippines, getting things ready. And about a month before we were supposed to leave. I was at youth group and it was a game night and I don't like game nights, but thankfully as an introvert, I just don't like game nights. Thankfully, <laughs> they would do this thing where they would just have videos playing and uh, music videos playing. So I decided to be in the atrium, watch the music videos and just kind of talk to God and be like, I'm not ready for this and I don't want to do this. And it was really interesting because the another fight that I'd been having with God for most of my life was, why do I want to be a social worker? Like, what is the point of being a social worker? I have this desire and it's so strong within me, but all I can think of is I'm going to go into broken homes and it's not going to make a difference. Like there's so many broken homes and, and like, how, how am I supposed to make a difference? Like I'm broken myself. I can't, I can't even figure out how to have a normal interaction with another human being kind of thing. And, uh, so I'm like processing this with God and really just pouring my heart out. And the song Follow You by Leland starts playing. And in the music video, there's someone on there that looked exactly like the on-site director um, of the orphanage at, in the Philippines. And I'd gone there previously with my parents. And all of a sudden I start remembering like how much I love the Philippines, the food and the people and the culture. And I was like, okay, so maybe it won't be so bad. But then it gets to the chorus and it says, I'll follow you into the homes of the broken. I'll follow you into the world. And I'm just like, you're throwing my words back at me, God. <laughs> I have goosebumps. Okay. Does everybody have goosebumps? I mean, seriously, I have goosey bumps all over me when you said that. So the song then, was actually like your cry out to God. And he's saying those words right back to you in the song. And at this time, um, you were 17, correct? I was 16 at that You were 16? Time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then um, the, the next line is, meet the needs of the poor and the needy, God. I'll follow you into the world. And all of a sudden I realized I'm not the one meeting the needs. He's the one meeting the needs. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to have it together. I don't have to like 
it's okay that I have trauma and I have issues and all that kind of stuff. So at that point in time, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to the Philippines and I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to support my parents' ministry and I'm going to do whatever God calls me to. And I kind of call it my moment of dedication because I realized I could do whatever God called me to because he called me to it. And I didn't have to be held back by my human nature. Oh my gosh. Can I just say, this is 16 years old. You're saying this to the Holy One. It's like, <laughs> this is so beautiful, Ina Gould. You are such a treasure. At yeah. 16 years old, you're like, I can do this because God told me that this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And, and by the way, you have been talking to him and, and, and having relationship with him since you were just very, very young, five years old. Mm -hmm. And you're walking through this whole thing. And then this huge change is happening, which anyone who has dealt with anyone who has trauma or, or, or uh, anxieties or any of those things, you know that a lot of change is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And here you are picking up your life and moving to the Philippines and you're being like, okay, I can do this because God's called me to this. And the fact that you saw in yourself the destiny of where he's going to take you for the years to come. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's so beautiful. That's again, like a Joseph story, again, like a visionary, like you are seeing visions of what God's going to be doing. And at 16, if you told people, they'd probably go, right, really? You're 16. Mm -hmm. But that's how he, that is how he's equipped you. That's the mm -hmm. stuff that you're made of. That yeah. at 16, you have this life goal and you know what he's going to do for you, in you, through you, to the people and how things are going to change because of that. But you also know at the age of 16 that it's God that's doing it, not you. Yeah. I love that you said you don't have to be perfect. You can have trauma. You can have issues. You can be a regular person. You can be dealing with things. Mm -hmm. And yet you can still have this amazing, phenomenal call on your life and you can still put one foot in front of the other Yeah, because you're trusting him. So thank you for that. Okay. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, no. I'm like, what? <laughs> 16. Okay. All right. All right. So here we are. You're getting ready. You've had your moments. You heard this song. Now you've dedicated yourself to let's get this done. Yes. So I, so we go to the Philippines, just going to, my computer's doing things. Okay. Should be better now. Um, so then I was like, okay, so we moved to the Philippines and I have to say the Philippines is probably one of my most difficult years of my life. Uh, I ended up getting stressed and do shingles <laughs> at the age of 16, not very normal. That's when I learned to play guitar and, um, uh, my mom ended up getting really, really sick and that they, they couldn't figure out what was going on. And then on top of that, I found out that, um, well, I started having flashbacks. We were, we were living on this orphanage complex and there was like this small kid home, the big kid home. I spent a lot of time interacting with the kids and about two months into to interacting with these kids, I started getting flashbacks. And I think the first time it occurred, one of the kids who had been taking a shower came out and he didn't have any clothes on. And all of a sudden my heart rate goes up and my, I can't breathe. And I start fading out and I, I'm back in the orphanage in the shower room. And I'm just like, oh no, what's happening? <laughs> and those kind of moments continued happening, happening for the rest of the year. And yet again, my response was, well, I'm gonna hide it from people because I don't know how to deal with that. I don't know how to handle it. But then I would just talk to God about it and be like, why is this happening? I don't want to remember this. I don't want to go back to living in the orphanage. I don't want any of this. And um, that, that, those flashbacks kind of continued through college. Um, they don't happen so much anymore. I've, I've gotten a lot of healing from that, but it was really, really, really difficult for me. Um, and I started doing research, trying to figure out if my memories were true, if it really was as bad as I remembered, I would have nightmares, so I wouldn't sleep. And in the midst of all of that though, because I, th I think God wanted me to, to face and deal my with my trauma, 
But in the midst of all of that, it was just this huge blessing of being in a community of people who, who just love to laugh and who love to, to have Sing. fun and eat food <laughs> and all these kind of things. Like the Philippines, I love the Philippines. I love the people there. Um, and, and like, it's so weird because before this time, I hadn't realized that when you start loving someone, your love just expands and expands and expands. There's no like limit to love. And so as I got to know these people and love them and, and really love my parents and, and rejoice in the fact that like our home life was very different in the Philippines than it was in America. In America. And we were growing closer as a family because we were all dealing with culture shock together. And we were all dealing with being in a new country together and dealing with, you know, my mom being sick together. And, um, but in the midst of that, I got to this point where I was really growing and connecting with caregivers and kids and the Filipino culture and, um, you know, everyone else who worked there. And I started noticing that they would come to me all the time asking for prayer requests. And I'm like, that's cool. I enjoy praying. I pray all the time. <laughs> and, but then finally, I was just like, man, they're, they're asking me for a lot of prayer requests. So I went to one of the caregivers and I was like, hey, so why do, why do people ask me for prayer? And she said, oh, well, it's because God hears you. And I'm just like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. No, God hears everyone. And I'm thinking, oh, this is your Catholic background. <laughs> and so I decided I'd already been trying to learn Tagalog because it's just a way to respect and honor someone is to learn the language that they're most comfortable with. Okay, hold on right there a minute. <laughs> <laughs> hold, hold on, stop the presses. Okay, you're 16 years old and you decide, I need to honor these people. I'm in their culture. I need to honor these people. I'm going to learn their language. Yeah. What you just said just struck me. So it's like, here we are like, Aleph, Bet, you know, we're trying to learn these little, we're trying to learn. This. Sister, you said, it's a way to respect and honor a person is to meet them where they are. That's what God does with us. That's what Yeshua does with us. He meets us right where we are. He mm -hmm. doesn't require us to come up to where he's at. He meets us where we are. Mm -hmm. And again, the Joseph story, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. exactly what you did. And so you decided at the age of 16, were you 17 at this time? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I was about you're 17. 17. Okay, because you're you're an older woman now. So at 17, you decided to <laughs> learn uh, learn a new language. Yeah, and you did. Well, mostly. I I mean, to call it, the Philippines is weird because most people speak English, and you can get a, get get away with it. Um, you don't actually know if they're comprehending your English, but <laughs> you, you that's okay. I deal with that all the time. <laughs> yeah, you, you can you can you can do that, but. Uh, we were taking classes at school, Tagalog classes at school, and my sister was learning Tagalog, and I was learning Tagalog, and I was having a lot of fun learning language. Like, they just love it when, when you ask them, what does that mean? What does this mean? What does that, how do you say this? Um, so I decided to learn even more, and really specifically for the purpose of praying, mm -hmm. because um, there's an idiom in, in the Philippines, it's, it's, uh, I have a nosebleed, which means you're speaking so much English, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> and prayer is one of the quickest ways to give them a nosebleed. <laughs> so I decided to learn Tagalog and specifically how they pray in Tagalog, because they have a very different prayer culture as well. They're a lot more thankful than we are as, as Americans in their prayer wow, life. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, and so... And then like learning the names that they use for God to show reverence to God and, and using those in, in my prayer life with them. But then we also did a uh, Bible study. I had to do a Bible study for my Bible study methods class anyways. So I did it with them and we were talking about faith and works and prayer and, and just like building that, like God wants personal relationship with you guys. And, and you don't need a mediator, someone who seems better at this God thing than you are in order to have relationship with God. Um, so that was pretty neat and pretty cool. Wow. That is, that's amazing that you were able 
to do that. And I, I love the fact that you weren't saying, well, you guys just need to learn better English. You were saying, I just need to learn to call it. <laughs> that's, that's how we're going to deal with this situation. Um, and again, you were able to um, show uh, your community how to, how to get to, how to get to God, how to get to him, how to, how to, um, you revealed Yeshua to them mm -hmm. and that they can come to him on their own, that they don't have to come through you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, that is just really, um, beautiful. And so here you are, you're learning, you're learning all of this. Um, God is speaking to you. You're growing in your faith. You're growing in your family's growing and doing well. Mm -hmm. And so what is the next thing that happens while you're in the Philippines? Um, well, I think like the, the really only end to, unless I can't remember, but, uh, my mom, got pretty sick and they were going to doctor after doctor after doctor, not figuring out what was going on. So we ended up leaving and going home. Um, and uh, actually it's really interesting because the next year at school in Montana, we were going through, so we did humanities classes. I was class, classical Christian education and we were doing uh, medieval humanities. So we're reading church history, all that kind of stuff. And we're reading Leviticus and Hebrews and all, and all this kind of stuff. And it was really interesting because as this new person who really wants to dedicate myself to God, I really enjoyed everything that we learned in humanities. And my teacher was a profound man of God. And at one point in time, he said, we're reading through Leviticus and we're talking about the separation of the laws. And I don't necessarily know that we learned the correct separation of the laws, but he's like, so, you know, we as Christians, we talk about the Ten Commandments all the time, but how much, how many of us give any clue or any consideration to what it means to keep the Sabbath holy? So I'm like, research mode. And I think in the midst of that, I started doing word studies through Hebrew and trying to learn Hebrew and didn't actually put a lot of effort into it, but was just trying because I wanted to understand different things better. Um, uh, it was also the year that we talked a lot about honoring your parents, because that's also in your, t in the 10 commandments. And he had some ideas that as a teenager, I didn't agree with. <laughs> um, but, uh, so you were actually were a teenager at one yeah, point. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, just checking. <laughs> yes. Um, but then college came along and, uh, I, went to college for human development and family sciences and I found out that like I had to deal with PTSD like I couldn't sleep I couldn't be in classes part of being in classes I would just get mad and angry because I was like you guys don't understand human development and we're having all these theoretical discussions and I'm like it's not theoretical you know um so anyways all that to say college ended up being a pretty rough time and I think that God really started working in my life through friends, through friends who had their own trauma, who I lived with. And um, I ended up moving to Ohio after I dropped out of college. And I don't remember exactly how this came about, but I was talking to, but I know I was talking to Gail about my family and just how much I'd, I'd improved in my relationship with my parents and how I reconciled um, some of my frustration at the fact that they couldn't meet me in my trauma. And I'm, you know, talking about it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a second, I'm really only talking about my mom, not my dad. Like I, I still have this, this anger towards my dad um, that might've been misplaced, might've not, I don't really know. But all of a sudden, I'm working all the time, and I just keep hearing Ministry of Reconciliation. And actually, I'm going to read it. Yes, good. Second, Second Corinthians 5.18. Is that what you're yeah, going to read? Yes. Okay. I, I have it. Um, 
Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. There, we are therefore God. We are therefore ambassadors for Messiah, as though God were making his appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to God. And um, I think the, th the thing that really, really hit me with that was I had hoped because my parents are older that like I wouldn't have to deal with any of my frustration with my parents until they were dead. Mm. <laughs> but it was like God, God was saying, no, not really. You can't, can't do that. I'm just going to peck at it and peck at it and peck at it and I remember there was one time I went on a walk I like got it. I went on a walk I was really upset and I'm just like but God you don't know what they did you don't know how much more difficult it was I mean they worked in adoption ministries they should have known all these things and um in their defense they didn't start really getting good training until I was a teenager <laughs> So, you know, um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm really, really angry. And at the same time, I was having a difficult relationship with, with a friend where I had harmed her and wronged her a lot. And every time I kept going back to her and, and trying to fix the situation, she would just throw back at me, but you did A, B, C, and D, and you haven't changed. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to show change if all you're going to do is throw the past back at me? And God was kind of like, I mean, aren't you doing that to your parents? <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> and so then I started wondering, like, what do I want from them? And I realized what I wanted was for them to come back and apologize for all the times that they traveled to the Philippines and to apologize for all the times they didn't see my PTSD and for all the times that the ministry affected the kids in their family. And for everything else. Like I just wanted them to apologize for all the pain and hurt that I experienced, whether it was caused by them or not caused by them. And I realized that if they did, it wouldn't change a thing. Wow. That's it, huge. I know. That's, that's huge. Yeah. You realized in that moment because of the relationship that was the blown up relationship that you had with one of your closest friends and you couldn't fix it no matter how many times you said you were sorry. You couldn't fix it no matter how many times you promised that those things would never happen again. Mm -hmm. Couldn't fix it. And he was really showing you about what was inside of you and how that, how that was relating to your parents. That's, that's huge. That's huge. Mm -hmm. So what, so when that happened, what was broken off of you? in that in that moment i think i realized um this all happened in the month of elul i was just gonna ask <laughs> what month was this happening in <laughs> the yep, month yep. of elul it's yeah. only it's not for the faint of heart <laughs> <laughs> yep um but i think I realized, and actually I'd kind of come to this realization in the Philippines with my orphanage, but mm -hmm. I realized again that the only way to move forward was forgiveness. Yes. That's um, huge. And I've written multiple blog posts about forgiveness, <laughs> but it is a challenge. It is a challenge because you get the whole forgive and forget and you get the whole, well, that doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with them. And, and, you know, I had a lot of people telling me just because you forgive your parents doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with them. And I'm like, I want relationship with them. That is what I have been longing for all my life is to feel like their child. And the other thing that I realized, and I think that this is something that when you've experienced rejection over and over and over and over again, you start protecting yourself from further rejection. Mm. And I had spent so much of my life keeping the wall up between my parents and I and wanting them to break through the wall that I'd built and wanting them to prove themselves perfect and faithful and to prove the fact that they would never, ever leave me 
Um, and, and I had a lot of insecurity growing up. Like I just always kind of wondered like, when are they gonna send me back to the orphanage? And that's not something that they communicated. That's not something that they meant to communicate. It was just something that I had held on to for years because of fear. And so part of it was breaking down that wall and approaching my parents as if I truly believed that they loved me and cared about me. And also talking to them about my forgiveness. And it was really interesting because my, my sister gave birth to a ch child. And so I came back to Montana for that. And I ended up living with my parents and we had an exceptional time because I was willing to be vulnerable with them. I was willing to serve them, help them, have a relationship with them, talk about the tough things. And um, we talked a little bit even about their own trauma and just how some of their trauma pours into raising kids. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So. Wow, that is, that is so beautiful. I, I, it's such a full circle. Again, what the Joseph story, <laughs> you know, the, the reconciliation of Joseph and Jacob uh, and all of the, you know, that, that story is reflected in what you went through because with Joseph and Jacob, there was trauma on both sides. I mean, Jacob was totally traumatized as was Joseph, but there was this, the reconciliation that happened. And, and can you imagine the conversations that they had? Mm -hmm. You know, why, dad, why did you send me out? You knew that the brothers were after me. Why did you send yeah. me out alone? You know, why didn't you protect me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just those types of questions. And, and, and you sister, you went into your family with this attitude of father, bring reconciliation. This is truly your, your life scripture, this second, second Corinthians, this ministry of reconciliation, I really do believe, I mean, not, not the only thing that you'll ever be doing, but I really do believe that, that you've gotten a verse that kind of encapsulates what all of this, the meaning behind all of this mm -hmm. is because you can reach out from this vulnerable place, from this place of actually experiencing it and continuing to to work in working towards health and working towards wholeness and working towards having the fractured pieces brought back together, which we all are, but you're doing it in such a, an interesting, unique way, but you're not waiting until you're fixed before you go out and begin that reconciliation with others. And that's what you did with your parents. Mm -hmm. You gathered them into this process. It's like the, um, the anointing that's over you for reconciliation. When you opened your arms to your parents, it's like the letter, you know, the letter uh, Aleph, which is like two arms reaching around and connecting to you, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you did with your parents. You reached yeah. out, reached around and you connected them to you and, uh, and, and forgave them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does the, I mean, forgiveness is so huge and we, we overlook it so often, um, but it's life changing. Uh, and, um, I can't, I can't think of the scripture right now, but it's, I think it's in, uh, I won't even say where I think it is. And it says that, that, um, oh, it was, it was in John when Yeshua came back after he, he resurrected and he came back and he, he breathed his breath upon his disciples. And then he told them forgive. And I thought that's a really interesting thing for him to say. He's breathing his breath upon them. He's releasing the Ruach HaKodesh upon his disciples. Mm -hmm. And the, the first thing he says is forgive. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if you forgive, they're forgiven. If you hold on, they're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and in your uh, wisdom, uh, <laughs> truly, you're a sage. <laughs> in your wisdom, you were able to see that 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 forgiveness was something that you had to pour out upon your parents in order for them to be set free, so that they could move forward. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what was happening with your friend, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Interesting. <sighs> yeah, it, it's um, two, two comments. So one, 
like having not been able to receive the forgiveness from my friend was just crippling. And, and eventually we got to a point where I was like, okay, I, I'm not going to wait around for the forgiveness. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. You're welcome to live in your prison. <laughs> mm -hmm. But two, um, one of the things that I realized in the process of forgiveness is that oftentimes we don't give forgiveness because we want the person who harmed us to heal us. And healing doesn't come from other people. Healing comes from God. And you have to surrender to God, to that healing in his timing, in the way that he wants to work it out. Because he's saying that he's making all things new. Yeah. Okay. We all need a nap now. <laughs> right? We all just need, I need to get my pillow. <laughs> I need a nap now. That is so true. That is that's precious. Can we can we take a moment right now mm -hmm. um, in the midst of all of this? You have a song mm -hmm. yeah. that you wrote that the that the Holy One uh, spoke life to you in and through this. And I would love for you to uh, I need more tissues. <laughs> um, I would love for you. Are you comfortable with that singing yeah. that song? OK. It's great. I apologize hey, if the audio is bad. Oh no, just that's fine. We'll we'll like I said, we'll take you any way we can get you. If you're on if you're on Facebook, will you give us a thumbs up and let us know that um, that this touched your heart too? Uh, chit chat amongst yourselves there on Facebook. Ina Ghoul is going to jump on Facebook after we're done here, and she will be chatting with you. So please ask her questions, and she'll be uh, in the Facebook Live group after. Um, and please remember that uh, you can jump on and join us for the Zoom after party when this is when we're finished here. If you are watching on a replay, please let us know. Just make a little note and say, hey, replay. Let us know that you're here. We want to know that you've been touched by this too. And for all of you listening on audio, thank you so much. Um, Ina Ghoul, are you good? You ready to go? All right, we're in yes. for a big treat here. I come to the fountain of living water to drink deep from this well, to drink deep from this well. I come to find rest from my sorrows and to trade them for joy, and to trade them for joy. So won't you meet me here? Won't you meet me here? For Father, you are ruler. Father, you are good. Help me know your promises are true. Father, you are constant. Father, you do care. Help me learn to trust your word. And oh God, my heart is weary. And I want to give up. I just want to give up. Won't you meet me here? Won't you meet me here? For Father, you are ruling. Father, you are good. Help me know your promises are true. Father, you are calm. Father, you do care. Help me learn to trust your word. So I come to the fountain of living water to drink deep from this well, to drink deep from this well. Oh, 
That is my new favorite song ever. Ina Gould, thank you so much. That's so, so beautiful, so precious. And you said that you would post the words to that song in the Facebook group. Um, we'll also post that in um, the community pages. Um, and, uh, you know, we have our we have our community pages now that is, is kind of mimicking our Facebook group. So if you're not on Facebook, of course, you can always jump in there. And, and uh, thank you so much. That was beautiful. That song, um, that song just pierced me. That is so precious. You're asking to come to the fountain where you can drip deeply from his well. And that's the place of wholeness. That's the place of, of total forgiveness. That's the place of healing. I love what you said. I just want to go over it again. I just, I love what you said about that. Sometimes we think that when somebody apologizes to us, that the healing will come from that person in the wound that they have inflicted upon us. And the revelation that the Holy one gave you was that he's the only one that can bring healing. Mm -hmm that that the forgiveness us forgiving others we even when they don't apologize us forgiving yes. them which means that we are not holding them we're no longer holding them accountable we're no longer demanding that there is a retribution we're letting it go and we're trusting that god will deal with it the way that he does in his justice mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that it wasn't hurtful, harmful, terrifying, traumatizing. It doesn't mean any of that. It's not saying that, that, that it didn't happen. It's saying that you're trusting God to be the one who brings about the healing in your life and in their life, and that he will deal with it the way that he deals with it justly yeah. and bringing about life from the midst of it. Yeah. Um, Ina Gould, you are a wise woman and I'm so delighted that you shared your story with us. So delighted that you opened yourself up and became vulnerable and let us just come in uh, just for these few minutes to see, you know, where you are and who you are. Um, and your message is so beautiful. And I'm looking forward to all of the ways that the Holy One is going to continue using you to touch people's lives, to touch people who are uh, dealing with trauma, dealing with PTSD, dealing with anxiety, dealing with sleeplessness, dealing with unforgiveness, uh, dealing with families that don't get you. Yeah, you, you are being able to do that. So, so in the midst of all of this, we just want to thank you and, and bless you. And I want to give you an opportunity um, real quick. Are there any other things like we, you talked about uh, one thing I forgot to ask you, <laughs> go back to when I asked you about how, how did this journey start for you? Mm. I know that the, that, that something happened when you're, teacher, your um, teacher said, if we follow the 10 commandments, why aren't we following this commandment that says that we should honor the Sabbath and keep it holy? Mm -hmm. And that started something inside of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't God so good that way? <laughs> He'll just use a comment and then we spin on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then yes. it's like, it disrupts your entire life. Right. So that's yeah. kind of where you started like, okay, well maybe that's so, because you've been following, uh, you've been following you embracing Torah, embracing the fact that, that the old Testament is not done away with that Yeshua's words were the old Testament, that it's all one book, that it's relevant, active, alive, and living today. And that it is not, uh, imprisonment, that it's yeah. actually freedom. Mm -hmm. And that all happened just, uh, you guys are gonna, you guys are gonna have a heart attack. That all just happened like less than six months ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? <laughs> That's what this looks like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, did you, did you want me to talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Yes. All right. 
So I have been listening to my roommate gave me a podcast. She was like, you love this podcast. It's like everything that you talk about because I've always loved the Old Testament. And it was called Bema Discipleship by Marty Solomon and Brent Billings. And I'd been listening to it and I told all my friends about it and we're listening to it. And it's basically going from Genesis to Revelations from an ancient Near East perspective. And um, when we moved to Ohio, like Leah and Aaron also listened to this podcast and we're trying to find churches and we're getting really frustrated. And uh, I was getting somewhat frustrated because like there, there are things that I value a lot that I wasn't necessarily seeing. Um, it's called Bema Discipleship. Um, and at one point in time, Leah's like, maybe I should just become a Messianic Jew. She's like, what do you think? And I'm like, uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I've never considered that. <laughs> and so I'm kind of having this panic attack of, I don't know like how that works. I don't know who, uh, like, to, like, I, I don't know enough about it to, to speak wisely about the situation. So I um, messaged Gail Heaton because she we've known I've known her since she hosted and adopted her kids and knew she was a Messianic Jew and I was like, help. <laughs> so she sent some books and we're all three of us were reading it kind of at the same time it was, it was funny. And, uh, and I still was like, ah, you know, I like I'm just doing this for Leah and <laughs> Gail was like, you should join the portion. So I joined the portion and I ended up listening to um, a teaching by Keisha Gallagher on Hasid. And I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh my goodness, this teaching is just absolutely amazing and exceptional and depthful and has meaning and purpose and it's actually gonna move people. And so then I started realizing that um, potentially, uh, that culture has more depth to them, which I love. And then I would get onto the portion on Fridays and um, I would be moved. But I was like, oh, but you know, I don't really need to do this. And then the month of a little hit. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I should, I guess I should do this. I mean, God, God is working through this, changing my life through this. I just should say yes. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll tell you what. Finding Messiah in the midst of, of everything, realizing that uh, he said that he was in the, be the word says in the beginning was the word, mm -hmm. the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning, talking about Messiah Yeshua kind of blows your theology, right? All of a sudden it's like, well, now the pieces are starting to come together. Because in John, in the beginning is 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 a an ancient Near East way of saying remember mm -hmm. Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created, mm -hmm. and so it's just it's really, it's really phenomenal how He is drawing and calling us to step up, and to begin recognizing who He really is. Uh, and it's not, it's not that there's, you know, all of us have a different path to get to where we're at right now. You know, we're all walking, we're all, we were all walking through our past to get to where we are right now. Mm -hmm. There's no condemnation. There's no, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. It's not, none of that's going on. It's all just a journey to get us where mm -hmm. we are right now. Yeah. And he really wants us to embrace him in, um, and he wants us to embrace his word, complete his total word. And there's no fear in that. And I, I, I see that in you, that you weren't afraid. You weren't afraid to embrace him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you didn't feel that you were going into legalism because that's one of many people's biggest fear is I don't want to go into legalism. I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't want to start putting things on myself that are going to, uh, you know, weigh me down and imprison me mm -hmm. on the contrary. Mm -hmm. we're, we're learning how to be um, free, how to be set free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I bet y'all thought that she'd been studying this uh, Torah for a long time. Guess what? She has been. <laughs> she just wasn't calling it that, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. 
that's he's been drawing you and he will continue drawing you and we just want to thank you we're going to have people asking questions um and like I said, Ina Ghoul is going to be able to jump on Facebook after we're done with our after party. Um, and we're going to complete our, our session here. And Ina Ghoul, thank you so much. And by the way, everybody, her name is Ina Ghoul. Like she told me, I and like school, ghoul. So Ina Ghoul, correct? Yes. I'm glad that I... <laughs> <laughs> do that because it would be horrible if I just told everybody to say your name wrong. But <laughs> Ina Gold, beautiful name. And thank you, sister, so much for coming on and being vulnerable and um, sharing with us, giving us your story. And uh, we just want to thank everybody who's listening on podcast and, and through Facebook Live and in the Zoom. We want to thank you and encourage you. Jump on. Come and see us. Spend some time with us. Um, I'm going to release everybody to... Um, uh, to, I'm going to ask everybody on Facebook Live to jump onto the Zoom now and let's have an after party. And I just want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Ina Gul, especially for that song, sharing with us that song that you wrote from your heart to him. And, and it's going to be reverberating in my mind. Take me to the fountain where I can drink deeply of you. Thank you so much. All right. Be blessed, everybody. We'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. Jump on the Zoom meeting. And we will be talking with you soon.